Hey everyone, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, November 6, 2015. This week we're going to be doing a lot of conversations about human space flight. We're going to talk about 15 years of ISS habitation uh, that NASA is now accepting new astronaut, astronaut candidates, updates on uh, Mars atmosphere, and uh, what's happening with New Horizons. And we've got a special guest, we've got Astronaut Mike Massimino. Mike, welcome to the Week of Space Hangout. Thank you. And we've got Kimberly Cartier. Hey, Kimberly. Hi, everybody. And we've got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. So, once again, this is a live show, so you're absolutely free to give us your questions, and I'm hoping you've got a pile of questions for for Mike uh, as a person who has been to space twice, who has uh, tinkered with the Hubble Space Telescope and, and now is working with the um, uh, at the Intrepid Museum with the Space Shuttle Enterprise. So, and is also a, uh, a very skilled actor, has been on the Big Bang Theory. So I think uh, we've got a lot to talk about. So go ahead, wherever you're watching the show, uh, click just in the video somewhere and you'll see the Q&A app. You can post any questions you want. I will be watching those questions and I will, I will pass them along uh, as we get there. All right. Uh, so we're going to take the first bit and we'll just talk to Mike. So, Mike, once again, thanks for thanks for joining us on the Weekly Space Hangout. It is a total pleasure. honor and pleasure to to have you here. Uh, Glad I am uh, I'm super excited. So, for people who have uh, no idea who you are, can you give us your your quick intro? And, and and like I know astronauts, you have these enormous intros that go on for hours. It's like it's like you know reading out some kind of just. Amazing accomplishment for amazing accomplishment. So, so uh, can you give us the, <laughs> the condensed version? Uh, I got to fly twice in space. On the, I'm a space shuttle guy, and both of my missions were to the Hubble Space Telescope. That is that is awesome. Okay, you can have more, more. Uh, so you're you're an engineer. You've been to space twice. You're now working with the Intrepid Museum. You also teach at Columbia. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. Uh, all right. Well, so let's uh, let's kind of go backwards here. So let's talk you about. You told me to keep it short. I know. I know. I, I did. You set me up. How the astronauts go on for hours and everything else. So I know. I'm only giving you a minute. <laughs> so if you want, you can ask me more. I don't know what I'm afraid. I don't, I don't want to happen. You know, I got yeah. this, You know, I don't want to. You know, uh, oh, I don't want to overstep my boundaries here. But yeah, that's it. Well, so so let's talk about the Intrepid Museum because this is sort of a, a pretty exciting time. All of the space shuttles, of course, are, are mm -hmm. retired and are now in various uh, public locations across the United States, and one of them is is there in New York City. So mm -hmm. can you let us know about the, the Intrepid Museum. Uh, the Intrepid Museum is here in New York, as you said. It's on the west side of Manhattan. It's actually an aircraft carrier, so it therefore needs to be in the water. So it's actually in the Hudson River, uh, uh, docked. Um, at a pier at 46th Street and um, and uh, 12th Avenue, uh, right here on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, it is uh, it's got a lot of really cool aircraft on it, and it's uh, uh, including uh, in including a uh, supersonic transport Concorde and the um, uh, Space Shuttle Enterprise. And right now we also have a special exhibit on Hubble. Uh, we, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of Hubble being on orbit, and uh, we had Hubble at 25 has been an exhibit that's been here for a little over a year, and will be here through January, and has some a lot of information about the flights I was on, including artifacts. So, uh, I I remember sort of each one of the space shuttles, how complicated it was to get them to these these museums, especially yeah. the one in in California. I got a chance to see yeah. the Endeavor. What was it like to get? Uh, to get to the Intrepid, I know you had to come up the river, right? Yeah. Well, what they did is, you know, they they flew it uh, on on a. Um, uh, hang on one second here. Sorry, I lost you for a second. Um, they flew it on. A, they had an airplane, a special a modified 747, that would transport the shuttle around the country, um, for 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 different reasons. If we landed at Edwards Air Force Base. Because uh, the weather was bad at the Kennedy Space Center, that, you normally want to land it at the Kennedy Space Center. And if you couldn't, on my second flight, the weather was bad. We had to go to California. So the way they'd get the the shuttle back to the East Coast on 
uh, uh, you know, to the Kennedy Space Center. They put it on the 747 and fly it into um, uh, in, into the Kennedy Space Center. If uh, when it, sometimes they need to be refurbished in California at uh, in Palmdale at uh, at Rockwell, they would um, they would fly it on the 747 back and forth around the country. So the way it got to New York it, in the in Enterprise was on display. Uh, it had never it's never been in space. It was used to drop tests. It was is a it is a space shuttle, but it was never flown in space. So the Enterprise um, was on display at the Air and Space Museum. The Ugvar Hazy uh, Annex, which is out at Dulles Airport, and it was out there for many years. And uh, the National Air and Space Museum to re uh, ended up getting Discovery, and so that so Enterprise needed a new home. So it was uh, given to um, here in New York to the Intrepid Museum. So they flew it in to uh, JFK into the big airport here, and then they put it on a barge and had it floated over here. To the museum around the Hudson, so that's that's how that's how Enterprise arrived here at but it's the Intrepid up, Museum. It's, it's up on the deck, right? Yeah. So it must have been rough to get it up. Yeah, they uh, they had some kind of crane, uh, you know, a big powerful crane that you could trust to to lift it up onto the deck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's phenomenal. And the one in California that I know the plan is to like actually stack it up and like get the the fuel tank and get the solid rocket boosters and and have the whole thing and it's you know it's one thing to just see the orbiter but to see the full stack I mean it must just be amazing to walk out there and so I would love to know sort of you know for when you actually flew on the space shuttle right just that you know that that experience what was it like to be kind of close to that 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 machine back in the day the uh, the shuttle um when it was on a launch pad, was was you know was, it was impressive. You saw the whole stack, as you say, um, and uh, you know it's a re it, it's a it looks like a really cool spaceship. When you get up for la on launch day, they fuel the solid the, uh, the the tank. So the 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 shuttle launched. It had uh, for propulsion to get to orbit. It had three main engines that were fueled by liquid fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. That was in the external tank, the big orange tank. And then it also had two solid rockets, very large solid rockets on the side, and uh, they would not fuel the tank for the for the main engines until very close to the time that you would launch. Because why do you guys think? Why would you not want to fuel that thing until right before launch? Oh well, it's it's incredibly dangerous. That's right. So you're creating a bomb in South Florida when you do that. So it's not a good idea. So they they would only do that uh, kind of at the last minute. And uh, well, you know, last, last few hours, and so going out there launch day is a little bit different because now you have this this vehicle is it's fueled and uh, it's it seems like it's alive because it's making noises and there's smoke coming off of it and it's just looks like a beast. So it has a really different feel to it when you're up up out there uh, looking at it when it's fueled versus not fueled, um, and again, seeing it stacked that way on the launch pad. Um, is is pretty cool. They're you know they're on display in these museums that I've I've seen I've seen the Enterprise of course, and I've seen the Air and Space Museum. I've seen Discovery. I've not yet seen Endeavor or Atlantis uh, since they've been on display. But they're really cool looking spaceships. All of them. The, you know the I mean I've seen the other ones up close on a launch pad. But he's in the museums even at display here in New York or wherever you go to see them. It really is something to see. It's pretty amazing, and the shuttle is a really cool-looking spaceship. You know, it's not a big. Uh, it's it's much bigger than anything we've flown, and it's not a capsule. You know, it's not a blunt body uh, spacecraft like we're actually going back to. You know, like a big Apollo spacecraft. That that's what that's the new ones we're building. Orion, for example, at NASA building, and some of the others these commercial companies have. What was amazing about the shuttle is that it went to space like a rocket. And allowed you to take a lot of cargo and a lot of people up, uh, and then you could take those same people and a lot of cargo back, and it landed on a runway, and got reused. And it was a really cool spaceship, a, little, a bit on a complicated size, and a little bit too dangerous for what we'd like. We had a couple accidents, but um, it was just an amazing spaceship. And um, if you didn't get to see a shuttle launch, it's unfortunate, but you can go see a shuttle in the museums now. And I think it's worthwhile to go take a look if you haven't seen it. Yeah, I I was at the launch site for the second to last mission, and unfortunately mm -hmm. there was a big delay, so I I missed the launch. So 
So I never got to actually see the shuttle launch, but I'm I'm going to try and make it for when the SLS launches because it should mm -hmm. be on on the same scale. Um, so let's talk a bit about about the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, your, both of your missions were to the Hubble Space Telescope. You really kind of specialized in in getting to know that that observatory. And the original plan with Hubble, right, was that it would be carried in the space shuttle up and down. They could make the repairs, make the upgrades, carry it back out. How come it sort of turned into this on-orbit repair, and and what was really involved in it? Well, I don't, you might know the history history better than I do. I didn't I didn't know that they were going to bring it down each time. I, th I thought the plan, you would service it on orbit and then bring it, it was designed to be serviced on orbit, and bring it down at the end of its life uh, and instead of keeping it up there uh, and letting it decay. Um, well, I, but, I think yeah. after it had been launched, it definitely wasn't, you know, no one ever assumed that's what they would do, but early, early right. on. Because they in built the it to be serviced. I mean, it was yeah. built. it was built so that it hand holds on it and it had, foot restraints on it and it had labels and interfaces for the astronauts to work on I mean it was built to be service so I didn't I don't know yeah. oh, oh if I did to bring it back each time but um but it was definitely built to be service in space and that's that's what I did um and uh, so I don't, I don't know how to answer your question, actually. Well, I don't, it just, think, it was, took a I don't of, think there was I a think, decision after they launched. I think the decision was made to make it serviceable before it launched. But it, but, it, but it still took a lot of very new techniques and a lot of really interesting sort of ideas to be able to do some of the servicing that, that was done, and some new tools and techniques were, were developed. I mean, it made for fairly complicated spacewalking, right? Yeah, so there, it was designed to be serviced, by astronauts, and so there were certain things like removing the instruments, removing um, both the support equipment like batteries, power control unit, uh, solar arrays, um, and then the fancy instruments that we have, like the wide field camera, advanced camera for surveys, the science instruments. They were, you know, they were not. I wouldn't say necessarily standard things to replace, but they were planned, and so we were, you know, they were. We knew about those ahead of time, and you could, you know, that before it was launched. There were a couple uh, repairs, or maybe that's what you're thinking of, where we did not uh, intend to do um, any repairs in place So for uh, of getting inside of an instrument. So for like the advanced camera for surveys um, and the space telescope imaging spectrograph, both of those instruments failed um, while they were on orbit and we did not have replacements. So you would, you would normally just take the whole instrument out and put a whole new one in if something was wrong with it. You would not go inside of it and try to fix it. You would just pull it out and put a new one, a completely new one in. Um, but in those two instruments, we, we uh, decided, you know, the, the, the Hubble program decided that it was worth the effort to try to develop tools and techniques to, um, to take those instruments apart in space. Like it was never planned to do that, to take them apart, get inside the machine, pull out the failed power supplies and put new ones in and then put a new cover over it and let it do its thing. Those were never uh, intended to be done in space, those intricate uh, operations of going inside because these instruments were bolted down, locked down with many fasteners so that you couldn't, there's no way you could get in. They, didn't, they weren't going to make it easy for you to get inside. But there was no intent to do that. So that one, that's, that's what was unplanned. Maybe that's what you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... And so to sort of practice on Earth and in pools and then to actually put that into work when you're up there dangling from the Canada arm, how did that go? Uh, well, okay, so um, you, uh, you, yeah, we, so we do a lot. I think what you're asking about is training and then the dangling from the Canada arm. You don't want to dangle from an arm. That's not a good idea. Uh, you're <laughs> right. actually in a foot restraint uh and the, you know you move. So we have two spacewalkers on a on a on a spacewalk. You always have two. We, they just did one today on the International Space Station. So uh, you you coordinate between the the two people and and on Hubble. Generally, what we had not always, but most of the time, you had one astronaut on the robot arm on on the you mentioned the Canada arm, the remote manipulator system, and that's a nice stable platform, um, and you can move around very precisely. And you don't have to worry about moving yourself because the arm will move you around. The, arm, the astronaut flying the arm will move you around. So then you could have your hands on something big. You can carry a big object and, and 
take stuff in and out of the, of the telescope. Uh, and, and that was generally the, the job of the person on the, on the robot arm. And then you had what we called a free flyer, uh, and a second <clears throat> spacewalking astronaut out there who would move around by using translating with their, with their hands and move from place to place that way. And so that was the job. You had a free floater and you had a RMS uh, spacewalking astronaut, so two people out there. And we would practice that, that, that entire spacewalk from start to finish in, the, in our training pool, the neutral buoyancy lab, which was a very big pool, uh, 200 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. But that was mainly, it was kind of like the closest you could get to what a spacewalk was a day of spacewalking. You would you'd go out there early and you'd you know, get checked out by the doctor and get your tools and your spacesuits together and get, get on, get inside and then get loaded into the water and start your spacewalk from st start to end. And you'd be on there for, you know, six hours or so, usually longer, and, uh, and practice your spacewalk from start to finish. And how and so, similar was how the pool to actually uh, then carrying out those same tasks uh, in orbit? So for um, for working the uh, for working the, the tools and getting familiar with the telescope, the mock-up we had was wasn't like super high fidelity because it's in the water, and so you wouldn't want to put a real telescope in, a, in the water. But uh, but we had we had very high fidelity uh, uh, engineering um, electrical testing unit of the telescope of all the systems and so on at the Goddard Space Flight Center in a clean room. So we could get familiar with it exactly the way it looked in the clean room with the real electronics engineering versions of those. But in the water, you know, it's a, it's a water model. So it, 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 it has to be able to take the water and, you know, and so it's not as high fidelity as what you would see in the clean room, but it's pretty, pretty good. And uh, as far as the, so you, what you do is you, when you train for space, you can't get everything in one place. You kind of have to put these different, uh, training experiences together into and kind of mold them into uh, your preparation to actually do it that day. And so, what the pool contributed was probably the the best training, the most valuable training was in the pool, because that gave you the idea of how you were going to you know, get into your spacesuit, move around the space shuttle, work with your buddy, uh, and and get the job done that that day. And just to give people a sense of scale, I mean, how how many times did you practice these repairs compared to, uh, you know, the actual space flight? I mean, you were training for how, how long were you training for, and how many times did you go into that pool and, and do those repairs? Uh, how many times did we do it? Um, yeah. In the water, um, generally, for most spacewalks, we would for like a you know a standard space station spacewalk, you'd have five to seven practice runs in the water for the one you would do in space. Um, for Hubble, we were between 12 and 18 uh, run, practice sessions in, a, in the water for each spacewalk we did uh, on orbit. That's that's just a, a phenomenal amount of a practice. And so, you know, and so as Morgan alluded to, once you got to orbit, I mean, your every motion, right, of your hand, every step, you knew how that was all going to go, but now you were in the, you know, the microgravity of orbit. Yeah. So the pool, you know, you would you would plan everything out and talk about it, and and it was written in a checklist in great detail, and you had took other notes. You know, you knew exactly the way you had planned to do it. And then in space, generally things would change a little bit, um, but you you know you wanted to try to stick to the plan, of course, because you knew that would work. But then things don't work the way they're supposed to, and you have to improvise a bit. Um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 the biggest difference between the water and the pool uh, the, and the space, you know, the pool and, and going in space, was that you're in water and water actually slows you down in your movements. And it makes you a bit more stable. When you're in space, you don't have anything to dampen your motion. So you're floating around there and you could, you could go, if, if you push too hard, if you push the same amount of force to move around in the pool, if you did that in space, you'd go flying. So uh, you had to adjust your... Uh, your motion, and you did that. You adapted to that very early. You had time to adapt to what it was like in space when you when you got there. So, um, but uh, but you know, it's it's a it's a lot of obviously a lot of training, and and again, the best training I think was what we did in the water. 
in the pool to get ready to spacewalk. And and I mean, as as an engineer, I'm sure you had a lot of ideas about how the whole process could have been been made better. Have you had a chance to kind of talk to future telescope designers about about you know what on satellite builders on how they could make their their instruments more uh, serviceable? Well, the only way they're going to do that is if it is going to be serviced and. Um, to make things serviceable costs a lot of money, and then you got to have a flight to go up there. And so, most satellites are not designed to be serviced. Uh, no other telescope is designed to be serviced other than the Hubble. Um, so, uh, the the hope is is that more of them will be in the future. But like the James Webb Telescope, there's no intent to service that in space. So if that thing gets launched and has trouble they're going to have to figure out either some way to get astronauts up there to to deal with it, but it it's not being designed to be serviced. Um, that adds a lot of cost to the whole to to the design and build to make it serviceable. Plus, you got to pay for a flight to go up there and service it. So the only you know the only uh, uh, satellite was service was Hubble. Now we did service some other satellites, some other communication satellites, and certainly there are things that people can do in their satellite to uh, to make it more serviceable. But again, that costs that costs more money. And usually these budgets are pretty tight um, as it is. But I, I hope in the future more and more of them will be made to be serviceable by astronauts. Um, but you know, it's complicated. Right now we have no way to get to Hubble. So even though Hubble serves, we can't even get there because we aren't flying the shuttle anymore. So there's no plan to ever service Hubble again. So uh, hopefully in the future we will be able to, to go up and service telescopes. But you need to be able to get there, and it needs to be designed to be serviced. And we don't right now have that capability. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, right? I mean, Hubble was arguably the most important, most useful scientific instrument literally ever created in the history of humanity. And it broke in a few ways. Um, like they all do and will, and and we, and we had the capabilities to fix it and and make it even better than it was before with new instruments and you know and and learning from all those techniques and and I think with the Earth-based telescopes, we, people really take it for granted. You can go over and pull off an instrument, and put a new instrument on, and hold it, right? And to be able to uh, to have this whole class of telescopes that aren't aren't serviceable, it makes the whole thing a lot more more fragile. So I think it, it really felt to me like NASA sort of figured out something really magical with the Hubble and with being able to service it, but then that lesson maybe hasn't been continued, which is too bad to be, I, I think. To you words, know, I got the commercial. Yep. We're gonna have we're gonna have issues potentially with James Webb, and as you said, it's it's out at L two, it's unreachable, right? It's right. it's just too far away, and so if that amazing t uh, array doesn't unfold the way it's supposed to. If, if there's just one little problem, y y the whole telescope isn't going to function. So, yeah. I don't know. And as I know, I always no. talk about on the show that we just, you, you always need more gyros. Right? Just yeah. More gyros. Just put more. I know for Kepler, there. we certainly would have loved to service Kepler after a while. Uh, get those reaction wheels back, fix the CCD. That would have been that would have greatly extended the lifetime of Kepler and and so many other amazing telescopes as well. But yeah, yeah, it's and great we could do it with Hubble though. And 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 with human space exploration, right? The the goal is to learn how to do this kind of stuff in space. The tasks that we do on Earth, like repairing a piece of machinery, we have to get practice in learning how to prepare a piece of machinery in space. So just the the value of sending humans up there to learn how to repair it and and put those thoughts into practice is tremendous value. So it's it's really sad to me. It's I always think that that to to not make the next group of of satellites repairable in the way that Hubble was uh, is too bad. It is, but it's um it, it's really just a, a cost and capability uh, decision. Um. If you're gonna if you're gonna do that, you have to have it in an orbit where you can get to it. So Hubble was put in in an orbit. You want to have your space telescope as far away from Earth as possible. So Hubble was put up at about 350 statute miles, because that's the ceiling of where the shuttle could go to. 
um, they wanted the James Webb telescope to be a lot further away from that. Well, by doing that, you not going even if you had the shuttle working, you're not going to be able to get there. So, um, you know, you you launch something to Mars, like the rover on Mars. Um, there's nobody there to fix it. So one of the smaller rovers years ago got stuck, and it's probably just a rock in the way, and you know, knock it out of the way. It's going to be fine, but there's no way to do that. So um, it's a it's a trade-off. If if you started making all these restrictions, like you said, well, in order for us to have web has to be serviced. Well, okay, then you're going to spend a heck of a lot more money to make it serviceable, and then you got to figure out a way to get there. And so it's a it's a it's a trade-off. So we we don't have the capability to get to everything. Hubble was was a unique situation, and the the hope is that web will work, and it'll be further away from the planet, so it'll be even better than Hubble. And hopefully it'll it'll won't have any major trouble, so that you won't be uh, you're not going to be stuck there with something that's not working. Well, I think the solution is we just need, as you said, we need to create the capability to service everything. And so it's just a, a lot of money, of though. You got yeah, to triple the budget. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. And, I'm a comedian, know, so, so you know, I can, I can uh, make whatever kinds of political, uh, you know, decisions I. Congratulations, but someone's going to have to pay for it, and. Um, yeah. You know, even the even the you know the commercial satellite. I mean, you need a way to get there. It's not, you know, even if you made it serviceable, you still need a way to get there. And right now, we don't have yeah. that way to get there. But being able to get to L two would be a tremendous capability for humanity. So it's yeah, uh, I agree with you. But someone's got to pay for it. So I think something like the you know the Orion, the the uh, space la the space launch system in Orion will be able to get there, um, and. But yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a trade-off. You know, Hubble was was it was great. You know, we could it was a great program, um, and it, uh, it it be but it's you know it it, had, it was a little bit restricted. It had to be within the, the grasp of the of the shuttle, and uh, now we don't have the shuttle, so we can't get there anymore even. So. Uh, so I'm going to take a few questions from the from the people watching. So this question comes from from Susie, actually her son, who is one of our the producers on this show, and her son wants to know uh, how it feels to be out on a spacewalk and know that you're only hanging on by a tether. He's awed by how scary and cool that that must have been. Um, yeah, cool so or scary. Which? Well, the I mean, you're not just hanging on just by a tether. You have a you do have always have a safety tether on, so that if you were to let go and float away, uh, this tether would bring you back. So you always have a safety line on, but you don't want to. Uh, you know that's not a good way to spacewalk by like flying around. So you you uh, it is it could be very scary if you uh, if you start tumbling off into space, but you don't do that. You 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 train so that you move very very slowly and deliberately. And very safely, and you work together with your spacewalking buddies, um, so that you don't have a problem. But yeah, it can be pretty scary if you go tumbling off into space. But we're very, very careful, and we move slowly, and we're very deliberate, and we we know what we're doing, believe it or not. And it's not that bad. I, I think it's you know trying to if you think about it, and like um, this, this young person asking a question, if you it might be kind of scary, but you, you get trained on how to do it. You know, doing everything is scary if you don't know how to do it. You know, driving a car is really scary if you don't know how, and flying a plane is really scary if you don't know how. But you learn how to do it, and it's not so bad. Then that's kind of the way spacewalking is too. You learn how to do it, and it's not so bad. It's actually kind of fun. It's cool. Uh, so this question comes from Jeff Burst. Uh, how did the fuel leak incident affect the spaceworkers' feelings and reservations about about going out again? What fuel leak? Uh, was it was it the fuel leak or the or the I mean, I mean, there was the water leak incident that happened a couple of years ago, where the uh, Italian astronaut had his, um, uh, I guess, his spacesuit started to fill up with water, mm -hmm. and I know they they made some modifications. I'm, I'm sure if that's what he's talking about, or uh, a more recent fuel leak on the space station. Hey, you're gonna have to give us a clarification, Jeff. I don't know, but uh, yeah. the the, I mean, the water, uh, the the water leak was inside the suit. That was pretty bad. That was actually uh, probably the most dangerous uh, situation we've ever had spacewalking, where Luca Palmitano was uh, uh, spacewalking. And what we what we do is we have a uh, the the spacesuit is amazing. It, it is uh, the life support system in it um, is, uh, is is unbelievable. We call it the EMU is the name of the it's the EVA mobility unit. So it's an acronym EMU, and that that EMU, the spacewalking suit that we have, 
is uh, is really miraculous the way it works. And one of the things it does is it it has a pump that pumps both air and and water. So you need water, you need air circulation, and you also need water circulation. And so the when you breathe, when you're breathing out and you're sweating, you put moisture into the air. And as that air is circulated, the moisture comes out and gets added into gets separated. The water and the air gets separated. The water gets the air the air gets scrubbed. Carbon dioxide and contaminants come out. Water gets taken out, and then fresh air is provided uh, through a you know, through a duct at the top of the spacesuit to the uh, to the astronaut to give you fresh air and, and keep you keep you happy. the The water is used for cooling. You have wearing a cooling garment, so then when the water is taken out of the air, it's also added to the water supply to to keep you cool within the suit. And you also have a a bag of water to drink from a water a water bag um, a drink bag. Uh, but that's separate. That's not the same water system. So, but what happened was is that there's kind of this interdependency between the air and and the water that's circulating within the life support system, and those lines kind of got crossed a little bit, and some of the water leaked into the air supply system, and so when it was delivering air to Luca, it also delivered water in over his head, and so water started to accumulate in his. In, is around with <laughs> believe it or not, and that would have been pretty bad. But that was a pretty dangerous situation. Um, I don't know if that's what he's talking about. You know, fuel. Leak, we've had other leaks. We've had leaks where astronauts have go had to go out. We had a um, a coolant leak uh, a few years ago where they had to go out and, and replace a piece of equipment. Um, on a on a yeah, and I remember there was like ammonia that was leaking. Yeah, so ammonia is bad. Yeah, ammonia is bad to leak. So ammonia is yeah. not a good thing. It's not good for people to be around ammonia. But it's it's very good for cooling. So ammonia is not allowed inside the spaceship. Ammonia is is part of the cooling loop outside of the spaceship, and the air the heat is transferred through a heat exchanger. So inside we have water that circulates that can heat up, and then go through the heat exchanger and transfer that heat to the ammonia, which is then venting the heat to space through the radiator. So uh, so if you get a, so ammonia, getting an ammonia leak is is not a good thing. And if you go out and work on air, you don't want to get that ammonia on you and then bring it inside of the spaceship. So we're very careful when you're dealing with ammonia leaks. But we've had those yeah. in the past. Yep. Uh, so we got a couple more questions, and then we'll move on to the rest of the show. So uh, question. This comes from Matt Woods. Um, uh, how did you relax yourself while you're working inside Hubble with the limited space and the long spacewalk hours? And you know, did they set aside any time for you to just gaze? No, nah, no. You get you get time. I you get time to look, and I had, you know, moments where I knew I'd have a little downtime. Or you're waiting. You get ahead, and you're waiting for your buddy to do something. Uh, at the end of uh, of my last spacewalk, my fourth spacewalk, I did have a, a chance to enjoy the view, and that was great. Um, but you really they don't set aside uh, relaxation time during a spacewalk. You do have off time. Uh, other other times during your your um, your mission, where you can enjoy the view or relax, but not during a spacewalk. Usually, uh, you're trying to make every minute count, and you might have some time where you can enjoy the view. Uh, you know, you just kind of take a break, sort of, but it's not built in. You got to try to find those moments when you can. Well, I just imagine it's like you're working in a really tight space, like on the you know, in a car, in a really uncomfortable position for eight straight hours, day after day, and you know, it must be it's got to be really hard on the human body to to do that. I mean, people, I think people underestimate just how hard it is. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty, you know, it it gets you going. It's it's long. It's uh, it's an, it's I, I look at it as like a sporting event, like an athletic event. When you're doing it, and um, you know, the better health you're in, the better shape you're in. You want to be well rested and well fed, and and feeling really good when you do it, because you're gonna. Re it requires uh, it requires you to, to to move around and to do things that could be strenuous. And uh, I think it's more like a marathon than it is a sprint. You're out there for a long time, so you want to keep going and 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 be healthy and do the best you can when you're. When you're out there doing it, and um, yeah, it's not it's not that easy. There's a lot of challenging things to it, to with it. Um, but you know, you're it's a great opportunity, and it's it's a really a one. I think it's the coolest thing you can do is go outside of a spaceship in a spacesuit and you know 
work yeah. out there and see what it looks like, and uh, so it, it's you know it's 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 right. worth it. But yeah, it's not always easy. Right. So the privilege was never lost on you, but it you no, know, it's cool. work. Oh, it's um, this question comes from Bjorn Larson. How did you handle the day-night shifts during the EVAs once every 45 minutes? Um, well, you know, when you're out in the sunlight, it's really bright, and uh, it's it's like a pure white light. It's not even like bright. It's uh, it's so clear when the sun is out because you're not you're above the atmosphere. You know, you don't have a window of the shuttle to look through, which kind of filters some of that effect. When you get out there, there's you know it's direct sunlight, and it's just so bright and clear, unbelievable. Um, and when you get into the darkness uh, for the other part of your orbit, then it's like there's no light at all. It's complete blackness. So um, so it's light. It's also a bit of a temperature change. It's much warmer in the sun than it is in the in the dark. So you adjust your you might have to adjust your cooling system. You have a thermal control valve like a thermostat where you could control the water flow through your cooling garment, which can make you cooler or warmer, depending. If you increase the flow, you get cooler. If you decrease the water flow over your body through your cooling garment, then uh, then it gets you can warm up a little bit. So the, and as far as the light goes, when you're in the sun, if it's too bright, you know, if the, you're in direct sunlight, you have a, a visor you can put down. Uh, you know, it's gold. It's actually a gold visor that acts like sunglasses, so, so you can see what you're doing in the bright sun. Um, and if it's when you get into darkness, you definitely don't want to, you want to get that visor up out of the way because uh, it's going to be really dark. And then you have helmet lights that you can turn on to illuminate what it is that you're working on. So, um, which did you prefer? I mean, these both sound tough. If you had to, you know, uh, you know, actually both are kind of cool. You know, it's kind of funny though. You know, the you know with the sunlight, you can see everything, and that's kind of cool. And I thought I'd be a little scared of the dark, you know, like, ooh, it's kind of creepy. But that's kind of cool, too. In some ways, it's good just to be able to focus on what's going on in front of you um, because it can be a bit overwhelming when you're out there looking around seeing everything. And you can still see stuff at night. You can see the stars and the moon and so on. Uh, but you can't, you know, you don't see the Earth as, as you don't see all the features of the Earth like you do during daylight. But but night's kind of cool. I like them both, actually. I kind of like the change between the two. It's kind of cool. I wonder if they, they time it so you get a full moon to, to help illuminate in the in the darkness. Nah. No. You know, they don't, no. Um, you, gotta, okay, you really well, can't. It's really it's not gonna. It's not. I mean, the moon. The uh, you know, your your the light you're gonna need because you're moving around. The attitude changes, and the moon isn't up the whole time. So you really need to have your your helmet lights on and uh, to see what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, um. So let's. I think we should move on. Morgan, you had a question, or do you want to? Should we move on to the the other stories this week? No questions. Okay, great. Well, let's move on. So we've got a couple of of topics that are actually sort of in your wheelhouse, Mike. So what, we'll sort of get your your thoughts on this. So the first one is um, we've reached 15 years of habitation on the International Space Station, Morgan. Yeah, so this is a pretty big milestone. Back in November of 2000, uh, a crew entered the International Space Station, uh, and there's been people aboard ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, this wasn't the very first sort of opening of the space station. Uh, it had been sort of in construction for a couple of years before uh, November of 2000. Uh, but this is a big milestone because the space station has had its uh, proponents and its detractors in terms of its cost and the scientific value of the work carried out there. But one thing that I think is indisputable is that the space station has helped us learn how to live in space and operate uh, a space facility for a long period of time. Uh, and over the course of these 15 years, we've had astronauts from a wide variety of countries uh, and space programs come and work together at uh, the ISS, and this has allowed uh, sort of a unique insight in how to get these people to work together, how to coordinate priorities amongst different countries, and these are all things that we're going to need uh, to be great at if, if we want to send uh, humans beyond uh, Earth orbit to places like Mars. Yeah, so yeah, I Mike, I know you didn't get a chance to to visit the station, but I know a lot of your best friends uh, are there all the time. Uh, you know, how is the how is the feeling about the station sort of among the astronaut corps now that we're at 15 years? Well, uh, we love the space station. It gives you a place to go in space. So yeah, no, we like it. It was a great, con it was an amazing construction project. And you know, as as, um, as Morgan mentioned, it's an international 
project. So it brought a lot of countries together. Uh, truly, uh, I think an unbelievable international project. Everything worked. You know, everything fit together between what we were building in different countries, and the cooperation between the countries was was just great to get it all done. Um, but it's a, it's an amazing an amazing accomplishment. I think it's a great engineering uh, accomplishment that uh, you know when I was a new astronaut in 1996, they were still planning what was going to happen. They were building the hardware, getting it ready to go, and starting just then when I joined, starting to plan the first assembly missions. And it just seemed like it was never going to, there's no way they could pull it off, and they did. So it's a really an amazing construction project. It's an orbiting laboratory for science. Um, and I just said it's been now 15 years. We've always had people in space, always, continuously. Always. Yeah, Every that's, it's that's amazing, been, right? There's been an American in space for all that time, and a Russian, at least one American and one Russian the whole time. And, uh, and then other countries have participated as well, uh, not continuously, but from time to time they've had uh, Japan, Canada, and, and countries of Europe, and so on, have had a, an astronaut up there. So um, it's it's a, I think it's a great it's a great accomplishment. I think we've learned a lot, and I think we're going to continue to learn for the next hopefully. Yeah, I mean it's many, like the many the years the space will still be working. Yeah, I mean the greatest value almost of the space station is that is that human beings constructed a machine of this complexity and and size and utility up in space, kept it kept people on it for this entire time. I mean, I I hope we never see another day that we don't have people in space orbiting the planet and that we just continue to extend and and grow the space, you know, the space station, the space city, you know, like this is our future and yeah. and the more that we put up in space and get it to stay up in space, the more we learn about this, it's phenomenal. I agree. Congratulations. Uh, all right, so Kimberly, um, uh, speaking of astronauts, if anybody wants to be an astronaut, now's your chance. Yeah, uh, NASA is putting out a call for the next generation of astronauts. Mm -hmm. uh, applications are being accepted in December and they go for a few months, and they're looking for a wide variety of different types of astronauts with all sorts of backgrounds from science and engineering and piloting and medicine and you name it, and they're looking for it in an astronaut. And they're planning, they have four missions planned already, uh, two to the space station, some uh, longer missions that go past uh, lunar orbit, and they're essentially trying to train up the next group of astronauts for their future mission to Mars, to put humans on Mars. So if you're looking for a job in the next few years, <laughs> uh, you can go to the NASA website and learn how to become an astronaut. Uh, I will be refraining from applying. Uh, I get extreme motion sickness, so I don't <laughs> think space flight's for me. But Never know. No. Any uh, any pro tips, Mike? If some if someone watching this thinks that they might have the right stuff, what uh, what can they do to to uh, enhance their application? Well, number one, make sure you apply, because you're not going to be considered unless you send the application in. So make sure you get it in and take as much time as you can with it to do a good job. Um, represent yourself as best you can. Be positive. Explain it in real English. Don't get too complicated. Uh, but you know, don't hold back on what you've accomplished and whatever experience you have, um, and try to try to make it so it reflects who you are, because uh, that's what they're trying to see: what kind of person you are, as well as what your what your qualifications are. But the main thing is is to fill the thing out and and get it in. You know, like oh, I don't know, maybe just fill it out, give it a try, you know, and and uh, and do the best job you can on it, and then see what happens. We should say your odds uh, aren't going to be great. Uh, no. Last time, four years ago, when they accepted applications, more than 6,000 people applied, and they ultimately selected eight astronaut candidates, all yeah. of whom eventually went on to uh, become astronauts. So throw your name in the hat, but I wouldn't expect uh, to get a call from Charles Bolden anytime soon. Well, you, won't get a call from him. you won't get a call from him anyway because he's too busy. <laughs> you, get a call, uh, you, know, you get a call from the astronaut selection office. Uh, is, is who you get the call from. But, I mean, yeah, you know, you're right. The chances are low, but your chances are absolutely zero if you don't apply. That's my point. Exactly. So it may be small if you apply, but they're small for everybody. So, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, what was the delay from when you applied as an astronaut to when you got accepted to when you actually did your first flight? So I started applying in uh, 1989 for the class of 1990, and I had three rejections. I got picked up on my fourth try, which was in 1995 for the class of 96. And um, so for me, it took about, uh, you know, uh, about, geez, you know, six, seven years of applying, and then uh, six and a half, about six and a half years of applying. And then it took me, uh, after I became an astronaut, it took me two years to be qualified as a, to fly in space. You go from, you start as an astronaut candidate, and then you graduate to astronaut. And then it took another two years for me to get assigned. So I was picked in, 90, first applied in 1989. I was selected in 96. I was um, uh, qualified to fly in 98, and I was assigned in 2000. And then I flew in 2002 on the mission that I was assigned to. And uh, but I, and so I, I guess the point there is as well is don't give up. That if you don't get in on that first run, the they'll be accepting applications again and yeah and take yeah, another. Don't give up. It. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's very rare for someone to get picked on the first try. I think that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it took me four tries. Um, my friend Don Pettit, who's been on the space station a few times to spend more than a year of his life on in orbit. Um, I saw him. He was in town on Monday. We got together, and he applied six times. We got he got chosen on the sixth time. So you can't give up. You know you got a something where there's no there's no shame in not being selected. And so you, and if you really want to do it, you're just going to have to get used to that. And you might get picked on the first try, but um, you might not. So and if you don't, there you know you just got to keep trying. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if if one of the things that NASA is looking for is people who don't easily give up. That's yeah, that's true. But they do. I mean, every once in a while, my my crewmate Megan MacArthur was picked on her first try. Uh, so it does happen, but it's not doesn't happen that often. Yeah. And so, sure will be. these then, um, Kimberly? Do they? You know, you mentioned that they're going to be doing some of the stuff like out. Uh, you know, not just the space station, but some of yeah. these sort of further missions, right? So what are some of the missions that they're they're looking at now? So I know that they have planned a few longer missions uh, to sort of train their astronauts up for longer duration space flight, longer duration experience, uh, experiments in space. Um, they don't have any... The, the human mission to Mars is not yet on the books, but they are trying to train people up so that when the human mission to Mars is on the books, then they will have people who have ex long-term experience in space, um, long duration uh, in small shuttles or, or the Orion spacecraft, of course. Um, so they're really just trying to give these astronauts the experience they'll need so in the future we can make a serious attempt at visiting another planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the hope is that, you know, this, this class... Um, We'll get a chance to visit Mars. That means you probably need to get to Mars in the next 20 years or so. And I, think I, I think that's the that's plan. Possible. Yeah. That's yeah. The, so hopefully that's that's the case. And you know, going to the space station is a great way to prepare for that. And and I think there's going to be a lot of exciting things. You know, it's been 20 years since I got selected, and a lot has happened in those 20 years. You know, we built space station. We finished out the shuttle program. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the next 20? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll be going to Mars in 20 years. That'd be great. That'd yeah. be amazing. Uh, all right, Morgan, uh, let's talk about the, I guess, the big update that everybody was speculating about uh, from NASA's big news announcement. And I always try to tell people to sort of like settle down. It's not going to be as exciting as you think it is. What did NASA announce this week? Yeah, that's right. There was a press conference this week to mark basically one year that uh, the MAVEN spacecraft has been in orbit about and studying Mars. And I should mention here that... Uh, the MAVEN spacecraft is controlled by my employer, uh, the University of Colorado, um, but I'm not a member of the MAVEN team. Uh, and so they released a number of interesting new results this week, uh, all focused around the question of Mars's atmosphere, because this is the uh, task that MAVEN uh, was designed to answer. And what they've been looking at is the change that Mars's, Mars's atmosphere has been undergoing, both in the present day and looking back into the past. Uh, because we think that probably early on in the history of the solar system, the atmosphere of Mars was probably about as thick of the, as the atmosphere of Earth is. 
uh, today. Uh, but today, Mars's atmosphere is just 1% as thick uh, as Earth's atmosphere. And so one of the first basic questions that they wanted to answer was, well, how rapidly is Mars losing its atmosphere today? Uh, and the answer seems to be uh, about 100 grams every second. Uh, and as one of the um, scientists on the press conference said, that's like a cheeseburger floating away from Mars every second uh, of every hour of every day. And that is sort of one of our first good qualification or quantifications of how much atmosphere is actually being lost. Uh, now, in the past, that rate would have been even higher because the sun, which is stripping away this atmosphere with its solar wind, uh, was more active in the past than it is uh, today. And this process isn't happening on the Earth because we're protected by the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, but Mars lost its magnetic field uh, long ago. And another of the results that they were talking about last uh, or this past week was that Mars probably lost its uh, uh, magnetic field about 4.2 billion years ago. And that's only maybe 300 million years or so after the planet originally formed. And so unlike Earth, which has now had its magnetic field for four and a half billion years, Mars had it for just a, a small fraction of that time. Um, but we do see evidence on the surface of liquid water being abundant on Mars all the way out to about 3.7 billion years ago. And so what that's telling us is we're starting to put this picture together of how the atmosphere of Mars interacts with the surface of Mars, interacts with the magnetic field generated deep within Mars. And what we're starting to see is that Mars had a thick atmosphere and a magnetic field early on in its history. It lost that magnetic field, but then it was able to continue supporting liquid water on its surface for about a half a billion years after that, before the solar wind stripped away so much of that atmosphere that water began to be untenable. And then that atmosphere has continued to be lost uh, for the intervening years all the way up until the present day. So if we want to replenish uh, the atmosphere, we need to send it one cheeseburger's worth of, uh, of atmosphere every second just to keep it neutral. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, I mean, it's really sort of building this big picture, right, of sort of when Mars had water, how long it was wet for, and that's really interesting how that's being matched with what's being uh, seen from all the ground observations as as well. I mean, would you say now that, that scientists have a pretty good understanding of, of pretty much all of the major highlights of the Mars sort of evolution over time? I wouldn't go quite that far. I think that MAVEN is really helping to fill in some of the gaps that we had in terms of connecting up our understanding of the atmosphere from orbiting spacecraft to our understanding of uh, the surface through the Mars landers uh, and the Martian rovers. But there are still a number of questions uh, left unanswered, like why did Mars lose its magnetic field so early? Uh, it is smaller than Earth, and therefore it would have cooled more quickly, but does that line up with the fact that it only had it for a few mil hundred million years over the course um, of, you know, a four and a half billion year lifetime? Uh, why uh, was water able to survive on the surface for half a billion years after that magnetic field seems to have dissipated? What does that tell us about the rate in the past at which water uh, was being stripped away out of the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, and also, what's the largest scale structure of the Martian atmosphere? And that's a question that one of our next missions to Mars, uh, launched by the United Arab Emirates uh, in the year 2020, is going to answer. The rovers have told us the story at the surface. Uh, spacecraft like Mars Odyssey and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have given us sort of this low altitude look at the atmosphere. Um, MAVEN's giving us this medium scale, a uh, few hundred or a few thousand kilometer uh, sense of what the atmosphere is made of. And uh, the Emirates Mars mission is going to go out to 25,000 kilometers, um, which is much, much, much farther out than it, we've studied the atmosphere before. And that's the area of space in which we see a lot of interaction between the atmosphere and the solar wind. So we're just wrapping up on the hour, and we had a few other stories to talk about, but I think we'll, we'll have to wrap them up here. I know um, Mike's time is is pretty precious, so uh, let's let's wrap things up. And uh, Mike, we'll let you go first. Um, where can people find out more about what you're doing now, and uh, and how can they come and see Enterprise in person? Uh, you can uh, look at the uh, it is uh, the website is Intrepid Museum. 
Dot org. So if you want to find out about the Intrepid Museum, you can look at intrepidmuseum.org. Uh, if you want to find out what we're up to at Columbia Engineering, it's, uh, you can look up Columbia, uh, columbia.edu website and look for the engineering school. Which and, classes uh, are you teaching? Uh... I teach a course in human space flight, and I help out a little bit with a first-year engineering course called the Art of Engineering and other things. So, yeah. That's awesome. And you're on Twitter, too. I'm on Twitter, Astro underscore Mike. I was the first guy to tweet from space. Uh, and I'm coming up with a website uh, that should be out uh, in about a month or so. And uh, so look for that as well. And and if you want to hear some more, I know you were on Star Talk Radio mm -hmm. within the last couple of years, and there's some great episodes with you talking with uh, Dr. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So you know, if you want to Google those, you can find Mike Massimo, uh, Massimino's uh, episodes with Dr. Tyson, and they're very entertaining. You're uh, super hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Kimberly, where do people find out more? You can follow me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier or on Google Plus. Uh, check out my website, uh, KimberlyCartier.org. And if you happen to be in the New Jersey area next weekend, both Morgan and myself will be speaking at the New Jersey Astronomical Association's Space and Astronomy Day. So come say hello in person. All right, Morgan. Ah, and I will indeed echo Kimberly. If you're out uh, in the tri-state area, you should definitely swing by on uh, a week from Saturday and come here. Uh, all of the great things going on at the New Jersey Astronomical Association, as well as get a chance uh, to meet Kimberly and I. Otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Morgan Renberg or visit my website, morganrenberg.com. Awesome. All right, and I just want to remind you that this this show really is a partnership among us and the fans who create this show. Uh, so you can go and check out uh, all of the goings on at the Weekly Space Hangout Crew community on Google Plus, and and they have a website now, wsh-crew.org. I think I'll get this right. Um, and, which is a uh, you know, you can go to the website that has a lot of the events coming up and and the guests. And a big thanks to to Nancy, of course, for setting up this episode with uh, uh, with Mike and uh, and all of the fans who suggested his name as a person to talk to. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, so if you haven't already, click subscribe. Well, we should wrap this up, Mike. Thanks for taking the time to, and thanks for sticking around for the whole hour. It was no, great my, to it's absolutely insights. my pleasure. I enjoyed it and uh, thanks for putting up with me. I'm, I'm glad I could do it. Is, is, uh, one last question. Is, is that the bulkhead of the uh, of the actual aircraft carrier behind you there? It looks like... This thing like, here? Yeah, it looks like some metal. It's there. a wall. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if... Uh, but you're in, a, far you're far in a boat. We're in a boat, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was sort of starting to suspect that. It that is you're a metal a wall boat. behind me, yeah. It's not drywall. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciate it. Thanks to thanks to Mike and uh, Kimberly and Morgan for joining us this week, and we'll see you all next week. See you guys. Thank you. Bye.